Japan is a land of great beauty. Mountains, temples, forests, and of course, tea. It is here that our adventure takes place. We journey through cities, towns, and countrysides in search of some of the world's best tea. In Japan, tea holds a special place in people's hearts. To some, it is a livelihood. To others, it is a ceremony, and to us, it is a never-ending quest. Every trip to Japan holds new lessons, new acquaintances, and new stories. This particular story begins in Tokyo, Japan's largest city. In this city, we see how tea has found its way into people's lives. We explore the innovative ways they have adapted this ancient drink into the modern age. We then head into the fields of Shizuoka to visit a few small family farms and see how they are making a living off tea farming without the use of pesticides or chemicals. We then head off to the old capital of Kyoto to trace down the origins of tea. From the sacred halls of Buddhist temples in Kyoto to the tatami mats of tea houses in Uji, tea played a crucial role in the development of medieval Japanese culture. We make a few stops at key historical sites along the way and examine what role they played in making tea what it is today. Finally, we head out to the South Island of Kyushu and explore the unique climate of this volcanic subtropical island. The soil here is rich and the climate is mild, making it ideal for growing organic green tea. Throughout this quest, we find an even deeper appreciation for what this drink means. In the last thousand years, tea has found a way to touch every single strata of Japanese society. Tea has a kind of magic to it that draws people in from all around. Whether they experience the ritual of the tea ceremony or simply enjoy a cup of tea with a friend, there is no doubt that tea has the power to transform. This is the purpose of our quest, to capture the magic of tea and to share it with the world. Hey everybody, it's Will here. I'm about to head off to Tokyo uh, to explore some tea culture, tea history, and of course some tea farms as well. Um, so for the next few weeks, we're gonna be taking a deep dive into um, Japanese tea history. Um, we're gonna be visiting some farms to see how tea is produced and how it's been produced over the years. Uh, we're also gonna be checking out some cool historical sites to see um, where tea really first got started in Japan. Uh, and how it became the world famous beverage that it is today. Immediately upon arriving in Tokyo, I was reminded at just how much there was to do in this city. At times, Tokyo seems to be a constant barrage of lights and excitement, but I wasn't interested in that. I was on a quest to find tea. No, not that kind of tea. This kind of tea. My first stop was a tea shop called Sario, a place that just recently opened in the last few years. This tea shop was an attempt to breathe some fresh life into Tokyo's tea culture. Hey everybody, I'm in a quiet neighborhood in Tokyo right now, about to go into Sadio, one of the world's first drip green tea cafes. Rather than preparing the tea in a teapot, at Sadio, they place the green tea into a ceramic cone with a wooden stopper at the bottom. After letting the tea sit for a few seconds, it's then ready to pour out. By lifting up the ceramic cone, the tea pours through the small holes in the wooden stopper and into the pitcher. The tea is then ready to be served to the guest. To add a little extra flavor to the third steeping, they add in a spoonful of toasted rice to the tea leaves to create a delicious genmaicha. Normally the flavor of a green tea begins to fade at around the third steeping, so this is a way to make the third steeping just as exciting as the first. One thing that really interested me was this clear teapot they had on display. This is essentially a modern version of the traditional Japanese Kyusu teapot. This teapot is perfectly designed to match the lifestyle of the modern Tokyo tea lover. 
It is unbreakable so it can be taken with you to work. It can be cleaned in the dishwasher and they can be stacked together to save space. While some tea purists may object to this, it is just one of the many ways that Japanese tea companies use new innovations to keep up with changing consumer habits. This made me curious to find out other ways in which tea culture was evolving. I headed out to Shibuya to see how people consume tea in one of Tokyo's busiest wards. In the popular department store Don Quixote, you can find an entire wall dedicated to bottled green tea. So I finally found the product I've been searching all over Tokyo for. This is the Matcha Love from Ito En, um, and it's a traditional drink with a surprising new twist. And that twist is when you actually twist this cap here, it releases a chamber of pressurized air that pumps the matcha into the drink and then you just kind of shake it up here. Bottled green tea is now the most popular form of tea consumption in Japan. This is thanks to the vending machines located at nearly every street corner in Tokyo. They keep the drinks cold in the summer and offer some hot drinks in the winter. While this may not seem like the best way to drink green tea, it has allowed unsweetened green tea to outsell both coffee and soda. In Tokyo, people are constantly on the move, but they still find time to fit tea into their busy lifestyle. But tea is more than just a drink. It's also an opportunity to enjoy a moment with friends. I decided to walk over to Gengen An, a trendy tea shop just a few blocks away from Don Quixote. Here you could enjoy a cup of hojicha or sencha with friends and listen to music. In Tokyo, when a young cafe opens up, it is normally centered around coffee, but the fact that this place is around just shows you that tea still has a relevant place in youth culture. This is a promising sign for the future of the tea industry. But what if you only have time for tea when you're on your lunch break? If you want to enjoy tea with your meal, you can sit down for lunch at one of the many tea cafes in this area. I was particularly curious about checking out a place called Chacha Noma in a Motesando. Here, tea is the main event, and food is just an added bonus. This cafe has found a way to put a more theatrical spin on the more traditional methods of tea preparation. Here, guests can watch the tea masters prepare their favorite drinks such as matcha and sencha right in front of them while they eat. They also are able to make kori dashi, an ice brewed tea that uses the water from melted ice to make a delicious and concentrated cold brew. But green tea is not just consumed by the locals. Millions of tourists come to Japan every year eager to take part in Japanese tea culture. Of course, more often than not, tourists are consuming tea in the form of matcha ice cream, matcha sweets, and matcha Kit Kats. In Japan, wherever you find tourists, you are sure to find these matcha desserts as well. The matcha desserts, like the ones found here outside Asakusa Temple, are made from lower quality matcha powder known as culinary grade matcha. This matcha is often very bitter and so it is usually only used alongside cream and sugar. Ceremonial grade matcha comes from shade grown first harvest leaves. The leaves then have their stems and veins removed to make them even sweeter. Once the stems have been removed, the leaves are ground in a stone mill and the precious green powder that is produced is called ceremonial grade matcha. Because it is naturally sweet, it is simply whisked into water and drunk without any additives. This was the type of matcha I would be encountering later on in my adventure. Finally, I wanted to see where I could purchase high quality, single origin green tea in Tokyo. I headed over to Ginza to check out Senchado, a place that looked like a tea shop straight out of the future. Here they had cold brewed sencha on tap and walls filled with packets of single origin green teas. They also had a small selection of food pairings like smoked pistachio, dried fig, and cinnamon almond. After browsing through the packets of green teas, I was reminded of my own tea adventures through the fields of Shizuoka and Kagoshima. I was anxious to get back out into the field and experience true Japanese green tea right from the source. It was great to see that there was still a place for tea in such a fast-paced city like Tokyo, but I knew if I wanted to track down real tea, I would need to leave the city. Just a few miles outside Tokyo, there is a beautiful land of mountains and fields of tea as far as the eye can see. I'm speaking, of course, about Shizuoka.
As soon as we arrived at the farm of Tarue Secha, they were eager to show us around their organic tea fields. This farm was run with just two employees, a husband and wife, who started this venture out of their love for tea. They grow tea in their backyard, process it in a small factory next to their house, and they handle the business and tastings right inside their living room. When they first had kids 25 years ago, they were concerned about the pesticides they were putting on the field, so they decided to turn it completely organic. It was here that we were reminded about the essence of an organic tea field. The concept is simple. Take what exists on the land naturally and use that to grow tea. Rather than apply chemical fertilizers to the plants, the farmers here simply take the grasses that grow on the field naturally, clip them, and then use them as a fertilizer. They also trim old tea leaves and use them as a type of mulch. This simulates the natural order of the field. Nutrients are taken from the soil to produce the tea, and then they are returned to the soil to support next year's crop. But they don't just support the tea crop, they also support a variety of different plant species. Rather than bare soil, you will notice a carpet of green vegetation at the base of these tea plants. This is a good sign that the tea grown here is supporting a healthy ecosystem. Hey everybody, we just finished touring the fields here and uh, I gotta say I'm pretty impressed. This is really a part of nature. Um, there's a lot of diversity of insect life and plant life at this field. Um, this has been completely organic for 25 years and I'm really interested to see what kind of tea they can produce. We're just doing a tasting right now at Tarue Secha. Um, I have a Yabukita Sencha here. Um, it's got a really nice color to it. It's um, kind of in between a jade green and a golden color. Um, and I get a little bit of this vegetal flavor in the beginning and it's got a little bit of a dry finish to it, but it's very fresh, very vegetal. Um, and it, just a little bit of dryness to it. So we're doing a tasting of two different teas. One is a hojicha, so this is a roasted green tea. Um, and then the other is a kocha, and this is a Japanese black tea. Um, so this is something that's a little bit rare, a little bit harder to find, but uh, we found a farmer that uh, grows the black tea here and um, like right in this town here and then has it processed somewhere else. And um, I'm very impressed with this black tea. It's got um, a little bit of this apricot note that I get from some other black teas that I've had in the past and um, there's a tiny bit of a dryness towards the end. So I just got my first test. They presented me with this bowl of matcha and now I have to make it myself. Um, so there are some crumbs in here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that I break all those up so they can form into the, um, the matcha. And then after I've scraped off the sides, I'm gonna do a little M shape here. So basically what I'm doing right now is I'm aerating the matcha. So this is gonna give it a smoother mouthfeel and a creamier taste. So you can see you got these very small bubbles here. Um, and that's really what you want. You want it to be, um, have a lot of air in there but not very big bubbles. You want the bubbles to be really small so it tastes almost like a latte. I think I did a good job. So um, we just got a pretty good demonstration of how a matcha mill works. Um, so this is a very, very small version uh, of the matcha mill. Um, these farmers purchased this to test it out um, to see how it works. And um, basically you have these grooves here that are going to grind the tea into a fine powder. Um, so how this would work is you would put this there and then you would put tensha leaves into this hole right here. And then as you turn, 
the tencha leaves fall into the grooves and then they get pushed out as they're grind into a finer and finer powder. And then if you were using a larger matcha mill, the end product that you would get is this right here. So this is a very fine powder, um, which can only come from a full scale matcha mill. Although the organic fields were beautiful and the tea was delicious, we needed to get back on the road to visit the next farmer on our list. We would be heading to the next town to visit Zenkoen, a small family farm in the countryside of Shizuoka. The farmer here shared a similar philosophy with regards to organic farming. His goal was to restore the natural order to the tea field and make sure that it does not disrupt the local flora and fauna. One way he was able to achieve this goal was through the use of natural fertilizer. So here we are in the workshop at uh, Zenkoan, and uh, we have a few different types of fertilizers that they use here. All of them are organic. So um, this right here is a charcoal fertilizer. Um, so you can see this is kind of like a burnt wood um, in little tiny chips here. And then over here, we have a, a mineral fertilizer made from um, plants and shells and things like that. Um, and then this is actually kombu or kelp. So this is like a kelp based fertilizer. And um, what they're going to do is they're going to mix all of these together in a certain ratio. And that's going to be the fertilizer that they put on the plants every November. Just as the sun was beginning to set, we were given a first-hand demonstration of this natural ecosystem at work. These two creatures standing in between the bushes of the tea field are siro, a type of wild goat native to this part of Japan. Organic tea fields are always teeming with life, but this was by far the biggest animal I have seen on one. Because the soil here is so healthy, it is able to support a dense carpet of vegetation around the tea field. These siro came out of the forest to graze here, to us, this was only further validation that organic farming is the way to go. We want to source our tea from fields that not only give life to tea plants, but also give life to all the animals that live around them. So those animals that you just saw were coming here to feast on some of the foliage. Um, so like as you can see here, um, this is something that some of the wild animals would come around to eat. There's also some wild pigs that will actually uh, dig through this soil and um, eat some of the earthworms and grubs from the soil. Um, so this is something you would only see on a completely organic farm where other plant life is allowed to flourish. Um, so as you can see here, we're really deep in the countryside. Uh, this is not those flat manicured fields that you see elsewhere. Um, this really is part of nature. Another unique feature of this tea field was that it was tucked away into the mountains. This has a special effect on the tea plants as they are partially shaded throughout the day. When tea plants are cut off from sunlight, they tend to produce more chlorophyll and theanine. This alters not only the color of the tea, but the taste as well. Shaded teas tend to be sweeter and smoother than their unshaded counterparts. Another advantage to mountain tea fields is the soil. This soil here is a lot more rocky and that can improve the tea as well. We're, we're kind of at a higher elevation right now and we got this kind of rocky mountain soil here. So we've seen this at, at other farms where you have a lot of this um, you know, rocky soil which is bringing a lot of nutrients um, to the tea. So this is going to have a very distinct characteristic as a mountain tea. After walking around the tea fields for only an hour, I was already very impressed with this tea farm. However, the true test of the tea would happen in the tasting room. So, uh, as you can see here, we have a lot of different teas to try. Um, we have two Fukumushi style senchas, so these are deep steamed senchas. Um, during the deep steaming process, it takes away a lot of the bitterness. Um, so we're really noticing that these are actually quite smooth. There's almost no bitterness in here at all. Um, and then we have a hojicha, so a roasted green tea. Uh, we have a kocha, which is a Japanese black tea. And then we have a uh, hoji gemaicha, which is a, a roasted tea mixed with toasted rice. So 
Um, this is actually the first time I've ever even heard about this tea, and I'm trying it now for the first time. Um, this one is, I would say it's actually kind of buttery, very smooth, very sweet. Um, with this one here, the kocha, the black tea, um, I would say it's got a lot of sweetness to it, a little bit of fruitiness, and it's just got a slight lingering astringency at the end, but it's really quite nice. To truly understand the importance of organic green tea, you simply need to go to the field itself. Every tea field tells a story, and these two told a story of humility and respect for nature. The farmers are careful not to take too much from the land or introduce anything that would disrupt the natural order. The animals here are allowed to go about their lives, finding food in the soil and taking shelter between the bushes. As important as tea is to us, it is not more important than the livelihood of these animals. This area of Japan is abundant enough for both to coexist, and when it comes to our tea, we wouldn't want it any other way. We spent the night in Shizuoka to rest up for our next day. In the morning, we would be heading to Hamamatsu and continuing our quest to find the best organic green tea. So we just arrived here at the fields and we're looking at an incredible mountain view here. Uh, we're really high up in the mountains of Shizuoka. You can see some tea fields behind me. Um, you can even see the lake in the distance there. Um, and there's just 360 degrees of beautiful views out here. After a one hour drive through the forest, we were rewarded with this spectacular view of the mountain tea fields. The farmers explained to us that they actually only come here about once a month. They call this a wild tea field because they actually spend very little time tending to it. Rather than growing in perfect rows, you see the tea plants expanding to fill whatever space they prefer. You also notice wild grasses on the land and even different herbs such as Japanese shiso. This creates a rich diversity and also a habitat for insect life. You can hear a whole symphony of sounds in between the tea rows as the insects move around and loosen up the soil. This loose soil is not only important for the ecosystem, but also for the tea itself. When the soil is looser, the roots of the tea plant are able to penetrate deeper into the ground and absorb more nutrients from the earth. The farmers decided to use almost no fertilizer this year and the tea crop turned out even better than the year before. They took this as a sign that this particular tea crop needed to be left alone. While they are hard at work in town at some of the other tea fields, this one takes care of itself. It's not just the insects that live up here, but larger animals as well. Here, 400 meters above sea level, far away from civilization, the farmers have reported seeing wild boar and siro up in these mountain fields. Just like with the previous farm we saw, you could see evidence of these visitors in the soil. These little patches were worn away by wild boar, searching for worms and grubs in the earth. This is a good sign that the ecosystem here is thriving. The type of tea grown here is the Yamakai cultivar, known for its light and sweet taste. In Japan, there are dozens of different breeds of tea plants known as cultivars. These plants have been crossbred over the last century to produce a variety of distinct flavors. Some cultivars are more suitable for sweeter teas and others are designed to be more astringent or bitter. Some cultivars are also better adapted to handle more harsh climates like this mountain plantation here. In this case, the Yamakai is perfect to produce a light sweet sencha and does not mind the wild conditions of this particular area. Of course, we didn't have to take their word for it, we could try the tea ourselves. The farmers prepared us nine different cups of teas to try. With so many options, we wanted to make sure we didn't miss out on anything. 
So we are doing a tea tasting of three different senches right now. Uh, we have the Yabukita, uh, then we have the Shizo 7132 cultivar, um, and then we have the Yamakai. Uh, the Yamakai is the one that was growing up in the mountains. Um, it's got a very nice smell to it. Um, it's very nice amai or sweetness. Um, and I'm getting a little bit of a fruitiness as well in here. Um, whereas with the Yapukita, I'm getting a little bit of a grassiness. The middle one here, the Shizu, uh, I'm getting a, a nice freshness, um, a little bit of a dryness towards the end, um, but just a very, very bold flavor, bold and full bodied. So here we have a green tea from the Inzatsu cultivar. Um, now this is a very uh, bright yellow uh, tea right here. Here's another one right here. Um, very unique color to it, uh, very dark, golden. With the Inzatsu, you're actually getting this very nice uh, orchid perfume, um, as they call it. Um, and so it's very floral, it's very light, um, very beautiful tea and extremely unique. After browsing the tea and beautiful teaware of Nihon Mosan, we headed back on the road to Kyoto, the cultural heart of Japan. Hey everybody, I'm in Hamamatsu right now, about to head off to Kyoto. Um, I've made some arrangements to do some filming there, and I'm really looking forward to getting a closer look at tea culture in Kyoto. Slightly north of Kyoto is a temple up in the mountains known as Kozanji Temple. This is where the first tea plants were planted in Japan. In 1191, a monk by the name Eisai brought tea seeds over from China and planted them in these sacred grounds. Just like that, Japanese green tea was born. But the monks weren't drinking the tea only for its taste. They found that it enhanced their meditation. The caffeine in the tea helped them stay awake and focused, while the L-theanine allowed them to maintain a calm and meditative mind. As a result, Japanese tea at this time was predominantly drunk inside the temples. That was really cool seeing Japan's first tea field by Kozanji Temple. Now, I'm going to be heading to Kyoto and doing some more tea hunting. Okay, so we're back in Kyoto right now, and we're heading off to Nishiki Market to see what kind of tea we can find there. Nishiki Market is a narrow shopping street of more than 100 shops and restaurants. Also known as Kyoto's Kitchen, this market supplies local vegetables, fruit, and seafood to the people of Kyoto. This market has been an important shopping district for Kyoto since 1310. Because of all the variety and excitement, Nishiki has also become a popular destination for tourists. Famous for all of its free samples, many Westerners come here to try foods they are not normally used to seeing. For me, it was an opportunity to see what kind of tea they had on offer. At this small tea shop, they sold all the basic types of Japanese green tea. There was Gyokuro, Karagane, Sencha, and Gemaicha. They also had some Hojicha that was freshly roasted. The aroma of this freshly roasted hojicha carried throughout the air, drawing me into the tea shop. Nishiki Market also had another beverage I was interested in trying, kombucha. Unlike the kombucha in the US, Japanese kombucha is made from kelp, a distinction that stems from an error in translation many years ago. Although it is becoming less common, many people in Japan still purchase kelp at these markets to make a special type of tea. The kelp brings a natural saltiness and umami to the water, so the resulting drink tastes a lot like a broth. Although not technically a tea, many tout the health benefits of this unique beverage. So now we're going to head out to the Higashiyama district to check out another tea shop. The eastern and western parts of Kyoto are divided by the Kamo River that runs through the city. On the eastern side, you have the famous district of Gion, and northeast of there, you have the Higashiyama district. This area is famous for its temples, but before I went to visit them, I wanted to sit down for a nice tea tasting. At this little tea shop in Higashiyama, I was able to taste three very different green teas. The first tea I tried was a Gyokuro. Gyokuro is considered to be the highest quality leaf tea in Japan 
and was once reserved for the emperor. The leaves have been shaded for over 20 days and during this time the tea produces more chlorophyll, theanine, and caffeine. As a result, this tea becomes a very dark shade of green and develops a beautiful sweet umami flavor. The tea also creates a more powerful calm and alert feeling that green tea is famous for. To prepare this tea, you often use a lot of leaves and a very small amount of water. This concentrates the tea into an extremely small quantity and the result is a dense liqueur that overwhelms the palate with this rich umami flavor. Next in the tasting was the sencha. Sencha is the most commonly consumed green tea in Japan and can take on a vast array of different flavors. Shaded senchas can take on a powerful sweet umami flavor going into the direction of a gyokuro, while unshaded senchas have more of a dryness and lingering astringency. The leaves of a sencha are steamed after being picked, which kills the enzymes responsible for the oxidation of tea. This is what keeps a green tea green and prevents it from turning into a black tea or an oolong. If the tea is steamed for a longer period of time, it becomes a fukumushi sencha, or deep steamed tea. These teas tend to have a rounder flavor with less astringency and brew a beautiful jade green color. Finally in the tasting, we have the hojicha. Hojicha is a roasted green tea that brings a whole new variety of flavors to the palate. While most green teas evoke flavors of fresh cut grass or vegetables, hojicha brings in elements of smoke, caramel, or even chocolate. This tea is either roasted by hand or in machines that turn the tea slowly and roast the leaves over time. This is a popular drink to enjoy hot in the fall and cool in the spring. When brewed cool, it brings out some of the more sweet and chocolatey flavors of the tea. After we were finished with the tasting, the tea master poured soy sauce over the leaves so that they could be eaten. It is common at tea houses to use soy sauce or vinegar on top of the leaves in order to turn them into a nice salad. After the tea tasting, I headed over to Ginkakuji, the famous silver pavilion. A lot of the palaces around Kyoto were designated as vacation homes for the shogun. It was here that the wealthy and powerful in early Japan came to escape the city and enjoy the peace of more natural surroundings. It is believed that in the 1400s, the shogun Yoshimasa built one of the first tea rooms inside this palace. Here people would gather from far and wide to see his impressive collection of teaware and utensils. The study of Japanese tea history begins with the monks, who used tea to improve their concentration during meditation. Then the samurai began to take notice of the apparent improvement tea had on their cognitive ability and concentration in the battlefield. The upper classes in Japan saw tea as an opportunity to showcase their culture and class with opulent tea houses such as this. In the next chapter, we will explore how tea evolved from here on out, from the discipline and humility of the tea ceremony to its universal acceptance by all people in Japan. The story of tea is certainly one worth telling. here in Uji right now, the first major matcha production area in Japan. In medieval Japan, demand for tea was expanding in the capital of Kyoto. To keep up with all this demand, the production of green tea shifted south to the area of Uji. Uji was strategically positioned in between Kyoto, the current capital city, and Nara, the original capital city of Japan. Uji is still famous today for its excellent quality green tea. Many tourists come to Uji every year to take part in the culture and history of green tea. In medieval Japan, the primary way to drink green tea was in powdered form, also known as matcha or powdered tea. To produce ceremonial grade matcha, first the tea leaves need to be cut off from sunlight. 
This is done with a special type of netting called kabuse. When a plant is cut off from sunlight, it produces more chlorophyll to compensate for the lack of sun energy. What makes the tea plant unique is that it also produces more caffeine and theanine. Caffeine has a stimulating effect on the body, while L-theanine has a more calming effect. By combining the two, you get the most desirable elements of both, giving you a calm, alert sensation throughout the day. Contrary to coffee, matcha does not give you a crash or jitters later on in the day. Shading the tea plant doesn't only produce more theanine and caffeine, it also changes the color of the tea plant. The excess chlorophyll production turns the plant from a lighter green color to a deep jade green color. Because theanine is responsible for the sweet and umami flavors of the green tea, shaded teas tend to have more sweetness. By shading a tea, you reduce the bitter catechins and increase the sweet and savory theanine. This is of course what tea drinkers want in a matcha, a sweet and smooth flavor with no bitterness. After a tea farmer shades the leaves of the matcha for 21 days or more, the work is still not done yet. The farmer then has to pick only the top two or three leaves of the tea plant to use in the matcha. The top leaves are the youngest on the tea plant and are known to have a sweeter flavor with less bitterness. They also have a higher concentration of nutrients. Once the leaves for matcha are picked, the stems and veins of the tea are removed. What's left is a type of tea known as tencha, a shaded tea that has had all of its stems and veins removed. The stems of the tea plant detract from the sweet and umami flavor, so they need to be removed in order to maximize the taste. Once the stems and veins of the tea are removed, the leaves are put into a stone matcha mill and ground into a fine powder. It takes approximately one hour for this mill to produce 50 grams of precious ceremonial grade matcha. The result is a powerful, vibrant green tea that is sweet, savory, and loaded with caffeine and theanine, giving you a calm alertness throughout the day. Of course, matcha is famous for its use in the Japanese tea ceremony an important part of medieval Japanese culture. Before the development of the modern tea ceremony, tea was seen as an opportunity for the upper classes to showcase their wealth. They held gatherings in opulent tea rooms with fancy utensils, and thus the early tea ceremonies became a constant game of one-upsmanship. Then a man known as Sen no Rikyu came along with a more humble vision for what the tea ceremony should look like. Rather than a gold-plated facade, Rikyu advocated for a rustic and small tea house away from the noise of the city. The first step of the tea ceremony begins not when you walk inside the tea room, but actually on the path leading up to it. While walking along this path, guests purify their hearts and thoughts and leave their worldly worries behind. In a symbolic gesture, guests also purify their hands and mouth in this water before entering the tea room. This allows them to wash away the dust from the outside world. The guests then wait outside the tea room to quiet their mind before entering. The tea ceremony is built on the philosophy Wa Ke Se Jaku, harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. An example of harmony is shown in the gardens around the tea room. The gardens are to be an extension of the flora surrounding it, living in harmony with nature. The next concept is ke, or respect. The guests need to respect all things, regardless of their status or position in life. This is demonstrated at the entrance of the tea room, where guests crawl through a small door. In order to get through the door, they need to bow. Samurai must bow, emperors must bow, and commoners must bow. Once inside the tea room, all guests are equal, regardless of their status outside. The third concept, se, or purity, is demonstrated by the tea master once the guests enter the tea room. Through a series of refined movements, the tea master cleans and purifies the utensils used in the ceremony. The concept of se does not simply refer to physical purity, but also spiritual and mental purity. The guests need to purify their mind of thoughts and worries when entering the tea house. It is only then that they will be able to enjoy something as simple as a bowl of tea in silence. Finally, after all three concepts are discovered and embraced, all people in the ceremony can embody jaku, or tranquility. 
This was the vision that Sen no Rikyu had for the tea ceremony, and his teachings still live on, not only inside the tea room, but outside as well. The inside of the tea room is modestly decorated. Each tea ceremony follows a theme, and that theme is simply conveyed through the use of a flower arrangement and a scroll. The theme of today's tea ceremony is wood, and the flower arrangement conveys the leaves beginning to fall from the trees. The scroll on the wall expresses the intention of cleansing our hearts before the upcoming winter season. The theme of wood is also conveyed in the objects used in the tea ceremony. Here is an incense holder made from bamboo gathered around Uji. There is also another small object that is used to produce a specific scent in the tea room. The rest of the objects are used for the preparation of the matcha. First, we have the hishaku, a bamboo ladle used to scoop hot water out of the kama, or iron pot. A small square is carved out in the tatami mats to make room for this iron pot and keep the water hot throughout the day. Next, we have the tea bowl, or chawan. This is a clay bowl made by hand, inspired by Furuta Oribe, a disciple of Sen no Rikyu. The bowl has a certain weight to it that conveys the importance of what's inside. Next, we have the fukusa, a cloth that is used to clean off the tea utensils before using them. This is a sign of respect for the guests, and it is done in a series of graceful movements. The natsume, or tea caddy, is the vessel that the matcha powder is kept in. Matcha tea has to be protected from light and humidity to maintain its quality. The chashaku is the bamboo spoon used to scoop the matcha powder into the bowl, and the chasen is the bamboo whisk that's used to mix the powder into water and form a nice foam. To prepare the matcha for the tea ceremony, the host first must prepare the tea whisk and the tea bowl. She pours hot water from the iron pot into the tea bowl to warm it up. Then, she will take the tea whisk and gently soak each side of it. This does two things. First, it heats up the tea bowl so that it does not cool the matcha down too quickly. And it also makes the bamboo whisk more pliable. The chasen tea whisk is made out of a single piece of bamboo with very fine bristles that can break if it is too brittle. That is why she gently moves the whisk through the water first, before preparing the tea. The host then discards the water into a kensui, or wastewater bowl. The bowl is then cleaned with a different type of cloth, called the chakin. Once the bowl has been thoroughly cleaned, it is time to add the matcha. The host adds two large scoops of matcha into the bowl. In this case, the host is preparing usucha, a normal matcha, but she may also use more matcha and less water to create a powerful koicha, or thick matcha. Next, water is added to the bowl using the hishaku, or bamboo ladle. Finally, the host begins the whisking of the matcha. The bamboo whisk is specifically designed to mix the matcha into the water in a perfect way. The whisk also creates small air bubbles in the tea, giving it a smooth and creamy taste. The host starts by scraping off the sides of the tea bowl and then moves into a diagonal movement to create a foamy texture. Once the matcha has been prepared, the host presents the bowl to the guest, with the most decorative side facing them. This is a sign of humility and respect, allowing others to enjoy the most beautiful part of the bowl. When the guest is finished with the matcha, they place the bowl on the other section of the tatami mat. Sweets are also an important part of the tea ceremony. These are served alongside the matcha to enhance the sweet flavor of the tea. This Japanese sweet, or wagashi, is made with chestnuts to complete the wood theme of the tea ceremony. But how are these delicious wagashi made? To find out, I would have to head out to Nara, Japan's original capital. In Nara, these two men are hard at work, pounding white rice into a sweet dough to make mochi, a type of Japanese sweet. This is Mitsuo Nakatani, the owner of Nakatani Do in Nara. He hits the dough at a rate of 3 slaps per second, giving him the title of Japan's fastest mochi maker. 
This style of high-speed mochi making is called mochi suki, a way to turn sticky rice into dough all by hand. The shouting also serves an important purpose, as they need to coordinate their movements in a rhythm so they don't hit each other. This is especially important when it comes to the hand pounding. After they are done making the dough, it is stuffed with sweet atsuki bean and then topped with kunaka, a type of flour made from roasted soybeans. In Japan, a nice sweet like mochi is considered to be the best food pairing for green tea, particularly matcha. The sweetness of the rice dough and the adzuki bean enhance the sweet umami flavor of the tea and help soften any of its bitterness. Nara was actually the first permanent capital of Japan, and it is here that the earliest records of tea consumption in Japan can be traced. In these temples, monks reportedly drank Chinese teas for medicinal purposes. This predates the growing of tea plants at Kozanji, so the tea here was not truly Japanese in origin. These Chinese teas were mostly ground into a bowl and drank with boiling water, a process that eventually evolved into what is now called matcha. The dominant way to prepare tea in the 16th and 17th century was through the rigid rules of the tea ceremony. Although Zen Buddhists lauded tea for the calm alert feeling it gave them during meditation, some began to seek a more simple way to prepare it. A Buddhist monk by the name Bai Sao advocated for the simplification of the tea ceremony. Around the same time, a farmer by the name Nagatani Soen developed a new method of tea production. He found that by steaming tea leaves and then rolling and drying them, he could produce a tea that maintained its beautiful color and aroma. It was through this process that Sencha, by far the most common type of tea in Japan, was born. To give you an idea of the significance of this invention, the birthplace of Nagatani Soen became enshrined as a tourist attraction. This humble family home is in the town of Uji Tawara, located slightly south of Uji. Even more impressive is the shrine dedicated to him and his legacy. This is a virtual shrine of tea. The upkeep of this shrine is funded through donations by large tea companies. Each one of them came to pay their respects to the father of Japanese green tea. Hey everybody, we're here at the shrine of Chaso Myoji. This shrine was dedicated to Nagatani Soen, one of the founders of the modern tea, Sencha. So this shrine was dedicated to him. He's considered the father of Sencha as we know it today. And various tea companies have shown their respect by dedicating these pillars to, to him and the shrine. The invention of Nagatani Soen made room for a kind of tea renaissance throughout Japan. Farmers began experimenting with different processing, and this gave rise to all the different types of green tea we see today. This spot in Ogura commemorates the invention of Gyokuro, considered to be the highest quality leaf tea in Japan. The name roughly translates to Jade Dew, a reference to its dark green color, another invention made possible by Nagatani Soen. Learning about tea history in Kyoto, Uji, and Nara gave us a greater appreciation for how much work went into making it. We now take the tea we drink for granted, but a lot of thought and hard work went into making it what it is today. But not all of the variations in green tea are strictly due to processing. Different growing environments can lead to different flavors in a green tea. Mountain teas with rocky soils can deliver extra minerals to the plant, giving the tea a distinct mineral taste that lingers on the tongue. Teas produced in rainy or foggy climates can get a natural shading effect to them, boosting the sweetness without the use of a kabuse. This is also true for teas that are grown next to large forests, as the tall trees act as a natural shading. The next farmers we would be visiting are located on the south island of Kyushu, in the volcanic subtropical region of Kagoshima. While Shizuoka is the largest producer of tea in Japan, Kagoshima is the second largest. The tea grown here is known to be sweeter and milder. Because the weather here is warmer than in the north, it is easier to grow a wider array of different plant species or cultivars. Some more delicate cultivars are ideal for producing light and sweet green teas, and these cultivars grow quite well here. A short drive from Kagoshima City is the second largest town in the region, Kirishima. Kirishima is known for its natural beauty. Tourists come here to see the waterfalls, the hot springs, and to get a glimpse of Kirishima Shrine, a beautiful Shinto shrine up in the mountains.
Kirishima is also famous for its excellent quality green tea, and we were about to get a master class in tea cultivation. So I'm here in Kirishima right now, and as you can see behind me, uh, there is a tea field that is partially shaded by the forest you just saw. Um, so these bushes right here are going to get a lot more shade than those at the end of the row. And uh, this is pretty common in Kirishima because we're up here in the mountains. Uh, we get partial shading throughout the day. They say that almost all the tea that comes from here is shaded for at least a portion of the day. And um, this is going to affect the flavor as well as the actual growing of the plant. So as far as, uh, as, far as flavor goes, um, when you cut off the tea plant from the sunlight, it's going to produce more chlorophyll, more caffeine, more theanine. Um, and as far as the growing of the plant itself, as you notice here, this may look like one big bush, but it's actually a series of different plants. So you can see that very clearly here. We have one plant, two plants, three plants. Um, and normally you can't see this. Normally there's more than just this top layer here. There's, there's a dense um, uh, brush of, of tea plant. Um, but because there's so little sunlight in this row right here, compared to the other ones over there, there's only enough sun for just this top layer. Whereas further down in the row, you have enough sun to support the top layer and then some other leaves underneath it. So what the farmers just did recently is a deep cut. Um, so they trimmed the tea plant all the way down to these thicker stems here. And uh, the reason they did this, um, and they kind of do this in, in, um, in the fall, is uh, to free up a lot of space so then the, the other parts of the plant that are down here have space to push through and get the sunlight and uh, they do this every couple of years um, just to you know kind of clear everything out and get a fresh start for the next crop um, so this improves the quality year by year so behind me are some wild grasses that grow around the organic tea fields um, and so this is one of the types of things they're going to incorporate in the mulch um, so we'll just kind of trim out this area from time to time and then return those nutrients to the soil. So this is kind of a more natural way to do farming. You're not introducing new elements to the tea field. You're just kind of using what's already growing here naturally and just putting it back into the soil. After the farm visit, we return to the city of Kagoshima to visit the tea shop of the farmers. In Kagoshima, it is hard to forget about the nearby active volcano of Sakurajima. The volcano is constantly spewing ash onto the city, and even cars parked for a few minutes can look like they have been there for months. The locals often carry around umbrellas to keep the ash off of their clothes. Luckily, the tea shop was close by, so the ash wasn't too much of an issue for us. Here we got an opportunity to try some of the green teas that were grown in this area. When pouring the tea, the farmer makes sure to alternate in between cups. The strongest part of the tea pours out last, so by alternating, you make sure that every cup has the same flavor. With the tea tasting now complete, we headed off to our destination to get a good night's sleep before visiting more tea fields the next day. We woke up to a very rainy weather forecast that made it almost impossible to visit any tea fields. We knew the weather would clear up later on in the day, so we decided to rent a car and get the driving out of the way early. Everything seemed to be on the right track, until... Hey everybody, so uh, we're on our way to Shiran, and uh, unfortunately we have hit our first uh, major hiccup. Um, so you can see right behind me, there's this big Tory gate, and it really sticks out right there, so unfortunately uh, we hit that little bump right there with the car um, and completely destroyed our tire. So uh, don't know what's going to happen next. Maybe we'll get towed or something, um, but hopefully we can get there on time. So we might be getting some help from the people in this neighborhood. Um, so that would be really awesome if that happened. So it looks like we're going to get out of here. It's just a question of how much it's going to cost and how much time it's going to take. Um, but I couldn't be more grateful right now that things aren't worse. <laughs> so I was just out there in the pouring rain changing a tire for half an hour. Um, I think I kind of redeemed myself after the whole Tory Gate incident. Uh, a woman from the town was nice enough to lend us some tools to, to help out and we really appreciate it. So 
Um, we're giving her uh, one of the gift teas that I got. And uh, with all the favors I'm having to ask around here, I think I'm gonna run out of gifts by the time I get home. But um, it's nice to, to do something and show her we appreciate it. Um, so hopefully we're back on the road now. We got the spare on. Um, we're gonna go back to the, to the dealership and, and see what happens. So we just got the new car and it looks like the last guy might have just hit the Tory gate as well. So I'm not the only one. So it's amazing how big a difference just a little bit of sun makes. Just an hour ago I was changing a tire out in the pouring rain and now we're looking out on the Kagoshima Bay. Um, so behind me you can see uh, Sakurajima, the largest volcano in this area. Um, and then over here you can see uh, the rest of the island. There's two little islands back there and then um, this is the entire bay right now. The sun just came out, so it's just beautiful out here. With the weather looking a lot brighter and the car situation fixed, we were finally ready to begin our next journey on the right note. It was time to leave for our final destination, the beautiful town of Shiraan. We arrived in Shiran with just enough time to explore the area. Shiran is a small town in the far south of Japan that contributes greatly to Japanese agriculture. Here there were fields of tea and vegetables as far as the eye could see. So right here you can see an organic tea field and some very dense foliage all around it. Um, so normally you see some grasses leading up to the tea fields but this is just really thick right here. Um, there's definitely no pesticides being used here, otherwise everything except for the tea would be killed off. Um, so I already see that they're using some of these native grasses and putting them in between the rows of the tea field. So uh, you have grasses like this growing here, there's a little butterfly in here. And um, they're going to actually kind of trim these every once in a while and then they're just going to kind of put them in here as a mulch. So in between the rows, you can see uh, a little bit of mulching being done. So this field right behind me is kept pretty wild. It's not in these neat rows that you see a lot of tea plants, uh, especially around this time. Um, and it's not this dark green because there's actually a lot of these smaller growths here. So um, these are probably not gonna be used for a tea, um, but it's just nice to see these little sprouts. This is kind of um, what you would what you would use for a tea. It looks a little bit like this, these young sprouts of the tea plant. Um, so these are the sweetest, most uh, nutrient rich parts of the plant. Um, so I actually might try to eat some. After seeing a few of the tea fields in this area, we decided to make the most out of the last few moments of daylight. We were at the very tip of the southern island of Japan and from this beach, you could get a glimpse of the volcano Kaimondake as the sun set. Also in this area was Lake Ikeda, a freshwater lake located right at the base of the volcano. This lake was actually quite a big tourist attraction, and although I was just a little bit too big for the playground, I gave it a try anyways. I think I'm stuck. Agnese! We woke up in the morning to a beautiful sunny day in Shiran and met with the first farmer of the day. Mr. Nuruki is a very talented farmer in Shiran. He takes advantage of the unique growing conditions of the surrounding area to produce an impressive variety of teas. Farmers often grow different tea breeds or cultivars in order to produce different tasting teas, but they can also blend the cultivars together to get even more of a specific taste. On this particular field, Mr. Naruki was growing two tea plant cultivars side by side. 
So here we are at the Yabukita field, and uh, this was recently uh, harvested, so you see the machines were moved in here. Um, it's kind of like stopped the ground flat. So we come over here to the Asanoka field. Um, here you'll notice a lot more grass growing around the uh, tea plant. So this is uh, clearly an organic field because um, you have a lot of other plant life supported in this area. Um, so this is the Asanoka uh, a tea that we use in a couple of our, of our products. Um, and you can see there's like some fresh cuts here as well. Um, so Yabukita is over there and the Asanoka is right here. To see just how Mr. Naruki is able to successfully blend cultivars together, we visited his tasting room to try a few of his blended teas. So here we are tasting the uh, Nohana Sencha um, here in Chiran. Um, and now this is a blend of a bunch of different cultivars. They kind of take the, the best aspects of each um, and make it into a very well balanced tea. So I'm getting a lot of complexity here. Um, for example, they use the Yabukita for that little uh, grassiness that, that they like in Essentia um, and the Asatsuyu to get the, uh, the nice color for the, for the Essentia. After just a quick farm visit and tea tasting, we were already back on the road to visit the second farmer of the day, Mr. Kowaji. Mr. Kowaji is a master of Fukumushi or deep steam teas. One of the main things that makes Japanese green tea unique is that it is steamed after being harvested. During the steaming process, the enzymes that cause oxidation are killed, and that is why the tea stays green rather than turning into a black tea or an oolong. Typically, you steam a green tea for between 30 and 45 seconds, but Fukumushi teas are steamed for a longer than that. This extra steaming process completely changes the leaves, destroying a lot of the bitter components and rendering them smoother in taste. The steaming also breaks down the cell walls, allowing more of the tea leaves to flow into the cup. This creates a denser liqueur and therefore it can be very easy to tell a Fukumushi tea when you see it. So we're doing a tasting right now of two different sensions. Um, this one here is an Asanoka and this one here is a Yabukita. Um, so in, in Kagoshima, in this area, it's uh, common to blend the teas together. Um, particularly when you have a Yabukita, because the Yabukita um, can be a little bit bitter. Um, has, has a little bit of shibumi, as they call it. Um, so it's common for them to blend uh, the main cultivar with other uh, different cultivars. So for instance, this year um, we're doing two-thirds Yabukita and one-third um, Asanoka or Yutaka Midori um, or another cultivar. Asatsuyu, for example, um, and um, that's just kind of to even it out and balance the tea out a little bit so it's not completely shibumi. Um, so these two on the left are a lot lighter than the two on the right. Um, these two on the right are, are coming from uh, these two teas right here. So um, this one right here is the Murasaki, and this is predominantly uh, Yutaka Midori. Um, so this has a very strong taste to it. Um, and same with this one too. They use uh, Yabukita for this one here, um, but they use only the top buds. So a very strong flavor. And they're also brewing this with a, only a small amount of water. Um, so this, this brewing right here is very concentrated. It's very strong and you just kind of take a little. You just feel immediately this kind of punch of this kind of umami and this little bit of this grassiness or this vegetal flavor. And then if I go for the Murasaki. It's a little bit smoother. I think this would be a little bit uh, more welcoming for uh, a beginner in tea than this one right here. Um, so these two here in general are for more experienced tea drinkers. If you like the flavor of Japanese green tea, I think you'll probably prefer these ones. Um, but it can be a little bit powerful for someone who's kind of more of a beginner in tea. After tasting a few of the Fukumushi teas, we wanted to see how they were produced. We drove over to the nearby tea fields to see all the work that went into growing these delicious Fukumushi senchas. So we are here right now at an Asanoka field. Um, and what we were just told by the farmer um, was that, you know, these, these two fields right here are completely organic. And sometimes that can be a challenge to deal with the bugs. But in this case, uh, the circle of life takes care of that because the larger bugs are eating the smaller bugs and then the birds are eating the larger bugs. So um, normally, uh, you know, having insects on this field is not much of a problem. 
um, because they kind of get uh, sorted out naturally. Um, so, you know, the, the, the pesticides are not needed in this case. Um, what we were just told was that it actually rains a lot in this area. Um, so all this rainfall is actually very good for the plants and it's a very mild climate here in Kagoshima. Um, so that's conducive to, you know, growing a larger quantity of, of leaves. And basically we're heading into a resting period for the tea plant. So December, January, and February, the tea plant's going to rest. Um, and this is important to build up a lot of uh, sprouts in the springtime. So when it comes time to harvest the tea plant, uh, the sprouts are going to be plentiful and healthy for the harvest. After traveling all throughout Japan in search of tea, we really learned a lot about the story of this magical drink. In Tokyo, we learned that even in a fast-paced urban environment, there is still a place for something as special as tea. Tea is more than just a drink. It's a moment to share with friends or to enjoy peacefully by yourself. This is something people will always make time for, even in one of the largest cities on earth. In Shizuoka, we learned how families are able to make a living from tea without compromising their values. If done right, tea can create opportunities not only for the people that grow it, but also for the animals that we share this planet with. In Kyoto, we learned how to respect and honor the principles of past generations. The modesty of the tea ceremony, the dedication of the farmers, and the curiosity of inventors are all values we must keep in mind. In the south of Japan, we learned how modern tea farmers are constantly improving their methods to create the best quality tea. The next chapter is up to us. After all the effort that goes into producing tea, the least we can do is put some effort into choosing it. Finding the best quality tea in Japan doesn't have to be difficult, but it can be rewarding. By supporting small organic family farms, not only are you getting the best quality product, but you are also helping ensure that there is a bright future for this incredible industry. By bringing us into their lives, these farmers have given us such an incredible gift. To give back, we wanted to share their stories, their passions, and most importantly, their tea with all of you. If you are interested in joining our quest to find the best organic tea in Japan, please check out neoteas.com for more information. Together, we believe that we can make a difference by doing things the right way.